I want to invite you to uh, Romans chapter 11. And as you open uh, to Romans 11, I want to remind you one interesting historical fact. Romans, 2,000 years ago, had an interesting uh, tradition. One, one of their generals, one of their commanders, military commanders, with his army would have a victory in a battle or a war, specifically more war, and when they would, they would organize it in such a way that they would invite the whole army back into the capital, Rome, and th they would parade them. They would call it triumphal entry. They would uh, celebrate that. All the people would gather into one place. They would flood all the streets and squares where the army would pass, and the army would show their might. Hey, we're victorious at the end of the day, right? They would show all the captives. They would show their trophies. As they passed, they would celebrate that. It would be a, a glorious day for the army, for the commander who won the battle or won the war. And they would celebrate that. They call it triumphal entry. They did care for it so much that after that triumphal entry, they would even build an arch to remember that triumph. Actually, even to this day, there is an arch to Titus, historical figure, who, who won Jewish war and destroyed Jerusalem, of which actually the Bible predicts. Interesting. And so they built an arch to Titus in Rome so that people don't forget the triumph. When we approach Romans 11, Romans 11 is the last chapter in the doctrinal portion of this letter. There are 16 chapters, and starting from verse, I mean, chapter 12, Paul is going to dive into more practical aspects of applying the doctrines he explained, the, mainly the doctrine of salvation. For 11 chapters, he expands and develops and teaches us what salvation is, what is the gospel in, in, uh, in its essence. And then he applies that to our everyday life. And so, when we approach chapter 11, the very last chapter on the doctrine, it feels like we're entering arena. It feels like Paul is parading something. He builds triumphal entry out of his doctrines. Not his doctrines, God's doctrines. He's explaining a lot. And so, he actually wants us to celebrate when triumphal entry would happen people would gather to see to shout to to just observe what what are the uh, trophies they would congratulate paul is doing same thing in chapter 11 of romans he won he is gathering all the doctrines he already covered he's he's gathering all the insights into what salvation and what the gospel is, and he piles it all up into one grand finale of doctrines. He wants to celebrate, out of all things, the doctrine of grace. So even called the triumph of the grace. The triumph of grace. He wants us to join in that Parade. He wants us to come, observe, and celebrate. I know most of us come to church to be instructed. We come and say, hey, tell us what to do. Here, where's the list for, to do things for this week? Another sermon with no to-do list. What I observed in my own life, and I see it happening in many of your lives, is that doctrine by itself transforms the heart in such a way that you actually do things the right way from the, from the heart. And that's the ultimate goal. It's not just to give you the list. Don't do this. Don't. No. Enjoy the doctrine. See the glory. See this parade, this triumphal entry. Be shocked in such a way that your life then goes 
in the different direction. And so he does it for 11 chapters and then grand, grand finales. He's just, he wants us to celebrate. So today's goal is just to observe the triumphal entry. Just, the, just enjoy the triumph of grace. That's it. And see what happens this week. As we're going to read, I want you to already begin thinking in chapter 11. There we will find in our passage five reasons for the triumph of grace. Five reasons for the triumph of grace. Let's read those verses. Starting from verse 1. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. For I myself am an Israelite. A descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? How he appeals to God against Israel. Lord, they have killed all your prophets and they have demolished your altars. And I alone am left and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the need to ball. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it's, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written... God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, stumbling block and the retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. I want you to understand that next few minutes it will be ultimately an introduction to the table so that we, we, we participate in communion understanding what is going on. So I want to view myself as just introducing the main portion, the main uh, part of our service. But it is ultimately a celebration of grace because it's a gift did you earn this no did i earn it no but it, we need to understand what grace is i know some of you say it's undeserved gift i'm done can i go home i understand an undeserving gift but there's so many edges to this beauty that Paul wants us to see and celebrate, that unfortunately we will we'll discover that we don't even see that. There's so much of grace that we don't even see. And he's trying to open our eyes to see, look, look, the triumph. Look at this parade. Look at these trophies. So let's list, list those trophies and look at them one by one. Five reasons for the triumph of grace. Number one. The reason, grace is patient. Grace is patient. Verse 1 and part of verse 2. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. In other words, did God reject? No, he did not reject. Do you see grace there? If someone is not rejected. For I myself am, a, am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people. Now, the question, has God rejected his people, comes rightly because of what he mentioned at the end of chapter 10. Mainly, majority of Israel keeps rejecting. And at this point, chapter 10 ends with God holding hands toward Israel, waiting for them to come, and they reject him. Verse 21 of chapter 10. But of Israel, he says, all day long, I have held out my hands 
to a disobedient and contrary people. And the question is, so are, are they are done? Is God rejecting them? Is God done with Israel? And Paul begins to develop the doctrine of grace once again, or more showing it. He already described that. He already explained that. Now he just collects everything in one big celebration. And he says, grace is patient. God has not finished. He is not done with ethnic Israel. It, the time for Israel will come. At the end of chapter 11, he's actually going is, is to describe that the remnant that he was describing as true Israel will become the whole nation at the end of chapter 11, and the whole nation will be saved. But for us here, I want you to understand an interesting fact. As he begins to describe that grace does not drop people in the middle, God is patiently working with Israel. And the main reason for that, Paul is using himself. Interesting. For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. What is he trying to communicate? He said, listen, if you're accusing God, that God is done with Israel, he doesn't like Israel anymore. Look at me. I'm saved. I'm an Israelite. I'm a Jew. And I'm saved. Don't blame God. I am saved. God is not done with Israel. I thought, what an interesting argument to shut all those, God is not just, what about the people there? What about people there? What, what, what about, uh, God is not just. He says, listen, I am saved. God is gracious. He's not done with us. I don't know how many of you participating in the doctrinal debates use the simple and one of the strongest arguments there are, I am saved. Look at me. Grace is real. Oh, it's only doctrine. Oh, you guys, are, I'm saved. I was a sinner. I was guilty. Now I'm free. This is a very interesting way to display God's grace and God's patience toward us is by bringing personal example. You and I should be there as well. We should be in verse 1 that says, listen, you are accusing God of something. Look at me, I'm a saved person. I was a sinner like you. God saved me and he can save you. That takes care of all reasons. You cannot deny changed the life. You cannot. You cannot argue against a life changed. So grace is patient. And Paul puts himself on the table and says, look, I mean, I persecuted church. You know my st story. Here I am. Can't argue against that. Look at me. God has not rejected humanity. Grace is patient. Number two reason for the triumph of grace. Grace is personal. God knows his people in advance in a unique and profound way. Look at verse 2b. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Just that interesting phrase, whom he foreknew. Foreknew. It's knowing ahead of the time. Now, there are two levels of that knowledge. One that many of you are thinking, for new means God knows ahead of you what's going to happen to you tomorrow. God knows what you're going to do to this afternoon, kids. God knows what kind of ice cream you will get. Maybe he even knows what you want to get and what parents will give you or not give you. God knows that. And God even knows your attitude after that. How you're going to become cranky and all kinds of... God knows all of that. That's a scary thing, right? And parents as well. God knows all your decisions. He knows ahead. That's a one level for knowledge. God knows everything. He knows past, present, and future. Just imagine that. 
Only God can do this. Of course, you're thinking, that would be nice if I know where I'll be in a year, right? Or where the market, stock market will be. That's probably the best thing, right? If you know what, what the stock market is going to be tomorrow or next year. And you can just play. There's so many, God knows everything. Just imagine, God is like, I knew this Monday. The, the, tomorrow is Monday, he already knows. He's just waiting for that to go through. But there's a different kind of knowledge he is describing here. A knowledge that knows and knowing that says, I still choose you. Knowing what you're going to do and you're going to mess up. You're not going to be pretty and I'm still choosing that. That kind of knowledge. Let's look at Amos chapter 3 verse 2. So the Old Testament, minor prophets, Amos 3 verse Two, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Now, if, if we talk about knowledge, God's knowledge, then this, and if we just talk about the, the level of knowledge, head knowledge of what people are going to do or what people are going to decide, then this doesn't work because God says, I only you know you out of all other nations. Meaning, that, well, that means if, if it's just a simple knowledge of what people are going to do, then God doesn't know what Moabites, Amalekites, Americans will do. Right? No, it has to be a deeper kind of knowledge. Different kind of knowledge. Knowledge that says... Only you, Israel, and he's talking about Israel in Amos. Only you I have known, not the other people. It's, it's a knowledge that goes beyond just head knowledge, what you're going to know, what you're going to say, what you're going to do. It goes beyond that, mainly knowing that Israel is going to be really disobedient, knowing that Israel is going to mess up and, and do all kinds of unpleasant things to God. God says, I choose you. I will be your father. I will be your husband. Whatever that form is of covenant promise that is, think of a, a marriage. Today, after this service, I'm going to go uh, uh, preach at, this, at the wedding. So there will be a bride and groom. They're going to be saying the promises. But they don't know what the other person is going to do tomorrow. They hope for the best. I will love you, whatever. Okay, I, I will take that. I, I, I trust that, that they, they really mean that. But they don't know. Honestly, they don't know. And so they're naively saying, well, I love you and we're going to be great. You remember the wedding day you had. But then the life hits. Now imagine if I come on the wedding day and say, you want to see your bride in 10 years? Here's the sh slideshow, and I'm just showing 40 years from now how she's going to treat you or mistreat you. Are you ready for yes? God knows till you drop dead, knows all the sins that you've done this week and you will do next week. And he says, I love you. Mine. You, you get that knowledge? It's not head knowledge. It's knowledge that goes beyond that. Not just information about your choices, but knowing those choices, it says, I'm committing myself to you. That kind of knowledge he's describing here. Amazing grace. Because we wouldn't do that. We wouldn't. Just take a, a simple case of Israel. Just think of history of Israel. Would you choose a nation of Israel for, to be your favorite? By no means, no. No. You take maybe Ukrainians, Moldovians, Russians. But that, either of them, right? Nobody, nobody qualifies for that kind of level of commitment. Jesus, knowing that, died. That's grace. Knowing all your sins, past, present, future, 
not pretty picture, committing himself to be faithful and love that person. That's the knowledge we're describing here. That's the knowledge we're describing. Grace is personal. We encountered that word for knowledge in Romans 8, 29. So this is not new. We already covered that. Just let's look at that again. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. This is nothing else but grace. Knowing, understanding, and at the same time committing himself to that covenant. Taking that obligation that I will be yours and you will be mine. Knowing that I'm taking this not so pretty package. That's grace. Number three. Reason number three. Grace is hidden. It's an interesting Discovery for me, hopefully you will enjoy this discovery that Paul is leading us through. Chapter 11, verse 2. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? Who knows, children, who is Elijah? The prophet, absolutely. Absolutely. When did he live? 1900s? A little earlier. Before Christ. During kings. During an interesting king called Ahab. Elijah. How he appeals to God against Israel. Lord. And he's complaining. He's crying to, to God. Lord, they have killed your prophets and they have demolished your altars and I alone am left and they seek my life. What what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men. Surprise, where, how? Who have not bowed their knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. So grace was hidden. Now, interesting story. In a book of uh, First Kings, so if you have your Bibles, let's turn to First Kings. There was a, a moment where uh, Elijah had a confrontation with 850 false prophets, prophets of Baal. Remember that story? What mountain? the confrontation took place. Mount Carmel. Okay? And so 850 against one. Who won? One. Because with him was God. Remember that? He said, build the altar. I'm going to build the altar. And whose God is going to send the fire? The one that is winning. Pretty much. He won the battle. All of them were killed. Great victory, triumph. Let's celebrate it. Now the question is, where did you get 850 false prophets in Israel, nation of God? Did, did you ever wonder? I mean, that's a lot. It's, it's, this, this, this building would be packed with false prophets. That's, just, that's the size. Where do you get those false prophets in the nation of Israel belonging to God? Well, the king. Ahab wasn't really pretty king. And he married not so pretty wife. And out of this came not so pretty policies. Let's look at this. 1 Kings 16. 1 Kings 16. Chapter 16, begin with verse 29. In the 30 eighth year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, began to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did 
evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all who were before him. He was in the Guinness World Record book. Who done most evil? This is me. Can I get the award? He got the award in the Bible right here. And as if it had been a light thing for him, verse 31, to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ithbal, king of Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. And Ahab made an Asherah. Ahab did not uh, did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. That's a pretty bad king. If you want to be the worst, you want to find the worst guys in the Bible, this is probably top choice for you. And because of his evil heart and his wife, the whole nation begins to slide into chaos. Look at verse, uh, chapter 18, verse 4. And when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, stop there. So this wife wasn't just promoting her idolatry. She said, I'm going to stop the prophets of God. I'm going to kill them. She was cutting them off. This is why I don't think it's, it's a pretty lady. And so after this, we have an incident of Elijah having a great victory over all those prophets. Seems like things are restored. Things are winning. We, we're going to be um, triumphing. Triumphant over false worship. Not so fast. Right after that triumph on the Mount of Carmel, chapter 19 Begins, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. That's a wrong choice. Don't tell that lady. And how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger, text message, to Elijah, saying, So many of the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of of one of them by this time tomorrow. Death warrant. You're going to die tomorrow. This lady has a track record of doing that. So Elijah runs for his life. Literally runs. Hides. And at that position, he complains to God. I thought we're going to win, but feels like I'm alone again. I was alone against 850 now it feels like I'm alone again against this big, huge system. Government, the whole government is against me. I, I, don't, I, I don't see uh, any hope. And in chapter 19, God answers, verse 18. Yet I will leave 7,000 of Israel, in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. During the moment of discouragement, God in Old Testament sends grace. How? He says, listen, grace elected 7,000 people to stand with you that you don't even know. And I'm just now letting you know, surprise, so that you can stand. The encouragement for Elijah was electing grace given to 7,000 people. That gave him strength to withstand persecution. That grace was, th those 7,000 people were already somewhere in the midst of Israel. They were there. Just Elijah didn't see that grace. And one day God opened his eyes through his word. Listen. Listen. There is grace. God is choosing, selecting, saving a remnant. You're not alone. 7,000 
people. Feels like at times we are living in that moment where we just feel like we're by ourselves. Maybe you felt that this week. Maybe you will feel it. Maybe you will re- re- understand it like that this week. Maybe next month. I'm by myself in this world. And God sends a message, says, no. There are 7,000 with you. I am saving people. I am keeping the remnant. That should encourage you. But you see, he didn't see that grace. He didn't see that grace. Often in our lives, we don't see grace. Often we don't. We just by ourselves, we're stuck, stuck here, no exit. And God says, no, 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 you're not alone. I am doing my work. Brothers and sisters, what happens Sunday after Sunday here is like that. You see other people worshiping God. What is that? God reminded you, you're not alone. I am saving people out of nations. And your brothers and sisters in church are those testimonies as well. Celebrate that. Grace is hidden. Fourth reason, grace is selective. God elects by grace. Let's read verses 5 and 6. The messenger, uh, I'm sorry, no, I'm not there. I will get to Romans 11. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. We cannot avoid those phrases. Chosen by grace. So too at the present time. So he connects that story of choosing grace in Old Testament, 7,000 people to encourage Elijah. Now it's happening in our days, in Paul's days and in our days. So too at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. Now, this is a a given, of course, and everyone understands. Grace is a a free gift, an undeserving gift. You did not deserve it. And so, he develops an interesting idea here. As in Old Testament, Israel had a faithful remnant that God specifically took care. He connects that to our time and says so at the present time the same process is happening you might not see it you might be like elijah i'm by myself he says no but god is continuing to save the remnant and to stress this he adds it is, if it is by grace it is no longer on the basis of works work salvation or salvation by grace i mean this is this is as classy as you can be we understand that salvation is not by works we covered that multiple times and yet he reminds this again probably knowing our nature we still tend to build our relationship with god based on our performance it's a It's an inclination that we all have, and he is correcting that and says, listen, if it is by grace, listen, those 7,000 people in Elijah's time were not better than the rest of Israel. They were not better than the rest of Israel. And he says, Paul, Paul says to Romans, those who are also part of that remnant group of saved people, they're not better than others because they haven't done anything better. It's not because of works. Works includes everything, anything that people have, could have been done, could have done, or could, could be or could have done. Nothing. Nothing. It's either or. And Paul says, Same thing in in our time. This is the miracle of grace. Why is this important to note to note here now? Grace is an undeserved gift. Today we celebrate that gift. We did not deserve it. You did not deserve it. I did not deserve it. God freely gives it.
Lastly, the last reason for triumph, grace is earnest. It begins with verse 7. What then? Okay, I understand grace. It's gift. It's a free gift. It's, it's glorious. I see the triumph. What if I decided I'm going to just go back to my business. I don't want to be part of this triumph. I don't want to be part of this triumphal entry. What if I just do a regular thing that every, other, every majority of people actually in this world are doing? They're not captivated by this grace. Okay, I, I understand you guys. You, you come to church oh, every Sunday and you celebrate grace. You sing about this. It's good for you. I just, I just like simple things in life. Is it okay? Can I just go home right now? Paul says, I, I know what you're thinking. Let me give you 7 to 10. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. Grace also warns people, don't neglect me. Don't pass by. Don't just set me aside. I am a very important. You cannot ignore me. You must not ignore me. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear, down to the very day. And David said, let their table become a snare and a trap, stumbling block and a tribulation for them. Let their eyes be darkness so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. Grace earnestly warns people not to ignore her. You must accept it. Because if you don't, their alternative is hardening. And it's interesting, he explains the process of hardening, the alternative of ignoring grace. He quotes three passages from the Old Testament. One from Torah, who knows what Torah is? Five books of Moses. First five books of the Bible, Torah. Then he goes to prophets, he quotes from Isaiah, and then he goes to the writings, which is Psalm. And he quotes from Psalm. He, he uses three samplings from Old Testament. He covers Old Testament saying, my argument is backed up by the whole Old Testament. So let's begin with first quote in verse 8. As it is written, this quote is a combination of two passages in Old Testament. One from Deuteronomy, another one from Isaiah. So let's walk through Isaiah, uh, I mean Deuteronomy first. Deuteronomy. Just one simple observation. Where is he getting this? It's Deuteronomy 29. By the way, Deuteronomy 29 ends with 29.29. 29. Who remembers what's 29.29? 29? Secret things belong to the Lord. Our God and the things that are revealed belong to us. Secret things be belong to the Lord. And you will understand that it is a lot of unknown yet. He quotes, Paul quotes Deuteronomy 29.4. But to this day the Lord has not given you a heart to understand or eyes to see or ears to hear. What is going on? Let's read the context. First four verses. These are the words of the covenant that the Lord commanded Moses to make with the people of Israel in the land of Moab. So this is, these are the words of covenant. He, he explains, beside the covenant that he had made with them at Horeb. And Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, You have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes. He reminds them of the, he, he builds this triumphal entry, re, uh, triumph of God's grace to them. You've seen all, all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all the servants and to all his land. The great trials that you, your eyes saw, the signs and those great wonders, signs, wonders, trials. But to this day, the Lord has not given you heart to understand. What is going on? One simple conclusion. It is a natural state of a heart. Because here in the passage, we see that there is no difference between Pharaoh, Egyptians, and Israelites. They just don't want to see God's grace. They walk through that. They experience that. 
They saw the miracles and they walked by ignoring that grace. Whatever. He says, that's a, actually a natural state of heart. Not to look for grace. Ignore grace. He says, this is a reality of it. And it covers everyone. Egyptians, pharaohs, Israelites. Then he quote, the, the, the uh, second part of it comes from Isaiah. Let's look at Isaiah and, and take another observation from that passage in the context of it. It comes from Isaiah 29, 10. For the Lord has poured upon you a spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes, the prophets, and covered your heads, the seers. And let's continue reading because Paul knows the context well. And he sends a really strong message to all. Eleven, the vision of all this has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed. When men give it to one who, has, who can read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot, for it is sealed. And when they give the book to the one who cannot read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot read. What? Verse 13. And the Lord said, because these people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me and their fear of me is a commandment taught by man, therefore, behold, I will again do wondrous things with these people with wonder upon wonder, and the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. He is warning them not to ignore grace. And in a unique way, he says, listen, you actually went farther than just rejection of Deuteronomy 29, where like everybody is just walking, passing by, ignoring grace. He says, you actually began to Talk about grace. You actually sing about grace. You actually come to me and do certain religious rituals. You actually participate in some religious activities, but your heart is not involved. So his warning in, in Romans includes that natural inclination and that inclination also to hypocrisy. And the third passage, he quotes in verse 9 and 10 and David says let their table become a snare and a trap where that coming from it comes from Psalm 69 turn with me to Psalm 69 in verses 22 and 23 let their own table become more be uh, than uh, table before them become a snare and when they are at peace let it become a trap let their eyes be darkness so that they cannot see and make their loins tremble continually. He is quoting this passage to communicate something else. So natural inclination, inclination to hypocrisy, and this is the third one. Of, he is describing hardening. Those people who ignore grace. He explains everything and says this is a very sad reality. Now, Psalm 69 is a very interesting one. And the quote strategically is taken from it to communicate something to all of us. Look at verse 9. Same Psalm 69, 9. For, this, for zeal for your house has consumed me. Where have you heard this phrase? For zeal for your house has consumed me. Cleansing of the temple. Right? When Jesus came and with the whip, draw everyone out of the temple. This is the house of my father. Kicked everyone out. And then the, the writer of the gospel comments, oh, this is the zeal for the house has consumed me. So Psalm 69 was applied to Jesus. Look at verse 21. Same Psalm, verse 21. They gave me poison for food, and for my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. Vinegar. Where do you, 
do you find that in the New Testament? On the cross. Jesus dying on the cross. They gave him vinegar to drink. To cleanse the temple, to cleanse the hearts, Jesus must be on the cross and drink that bitter cup. The very next verse is 22. They are not to reject. That's the quote Paul is using. So he's strategically taking that and says, listen, I know it's inter- in- inclination of every heart. I know you are covering it up with hypocrisy. But listen, ultimately, when you reject grace, you reject the only way to salvation is Christ Jesus. Very serious warning. So grace is not just a free gift. It's a warning not to take it. On the package it says, never leave behind. Don't ignore. Don't pass by. This is where the grace becomes serious. It says, yes, I am free gift, but don't, don't look at it as a cheap gift. It's a very expensive gift. It's very valuable. Never ignore it. Because hardening happens if you walk by it. And he uses one after another illustration to show that it's a very dangerous path if you don't submit to grace. What happens then? Only one word. Verse 9, at the end of it. A retribution for them. What is retribution? This is very rare word. I don't think you use it in the everyday vocabulary. Retribution means you've earned it and you receive what you've earned. A payment, a punishment. That's an interesting idea. When we talk about salvation and being a remnant and saved, it's a free gift you did not earn. And he underlines that. It's not your works. It's a free gift from God. God says, I'm giving it to you. But rejection and then ultimately condemnation for eternity is retributed. It's a retribution. It's something that you deserve because you earned that. So at the end of the day, Paul steps back and says, God is sovereign in your salvation and you're guilty in your rejection. This is a triumph of grace. This is a celebration, a true celebration of God's grace. What does this text mean to us today? First, if you're saying, I still, I, if God is sovereign, what about me? And you're still not connecting certain things. Deuteronomy 29, the quote that comes, sends you, secret things still belong to the Lord. But what's revealed should humble you. Remember Job, he had a lot of questions to God. I don't understand a lot of things. And God shows and says, let me just take you to class and I'm explain you everything. No, no, no. He comes and gives him 77 more questions. How about this? How about this? How about this? He says, oh, I put my hand over my mouth. I am done. I'm not going to. And the reaction that Job has is a very good example for all, for all of us to follow. If I don't understand something, I don't argue with God. I say, I'm humbly submitting to you, God. That's the only right attitude. If you have not repented, maybe you have not submitted to that grace. Maybe you've been walking by that grace Sunday after Sunday, day after day. And today God actually opened your eyes to see that grace. The Christ died for you. If you see that, they're not to walk by. Don't walk by it. Embrace that. Because the alternative is described here. Don't undermine grace. 